Jesus who died shall be satisfied. The story is not over until our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ comes into all of his own and swallows up death in victory. Jesus who died will be satisfied. He will be vindicated. And all our eyes will see it. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in worship this morning. <clears throat> there are five universal limitations that all humans have in common. Five universal limitations that we all share. The first one is our physical vulnerability. The fact that we can be incapacitated by illness or by injury. We all have that limitation. The second limitation is that we all share in our mortality. The fact that we all will die, that we all have limited time in the world. Then there is our dependence on external circumstances. The people down in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, dependent upon external circumstances, praying that the weather will cooperate, praying that the storms will cease. And when you think about them, remember to pray for them. Another hurricane is apparently headed their way soon this week, dependent on external circumstances. Then we all have cognitive or emotional limitations. And when life presses us to our limits, we can be broken down, we can be hindered, we can be derailed. We all have that limitation. And then finally, we all have finite capacity for growth and for learning. There's only so much we can know, only so much we can adapt to. These are the five limitations of every human being. On the other hand, God has no limitations. God is not rushed along by time. God is timeless. He is the ancient of days. He has no beginning of days nor end of years. God is not limited by time. And God has no emotional limitations. That's why he's so patient with you and with me. God has no emotional limitation. Disappointment cannot wear him down. Frustration cannot force him to throw in the towel. God has no emotional limitation. And God knows all things. He's not limited in knowledge. God knows all things. And God sees all things as they truly are. And while God is not inherently dependent on external circumstances, God often makes his plans and his purposes dependent upon our cooperation. I'll say that again. God often makes his plans and his purposes dependent upon your cooperation. And since we have limitations, God's plan is not always carried out in the way that God would have done it if he did it himself but he still manages to accomplish his purpose through us, despite our shortcomings. Recall from last week, God's vision for the Hebrews in captivity in Egypt. God says to Moses, you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt and you will say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. So now, please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. So I will reach out with my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. That's his plan. Up front, it's simple and it's plain. And were God doing it himself and not through his agent Moses, the plan would have been carried out exactly the way that God pronounced it. But Moses has limitations. So he responds to God and said in verse 10, please Lord, I have never been eloquent 
neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. For I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. I have limitations. And because of my limitations, I can't do what you're asking me to do. I just can't do it. And here's the proof. I have never been eloquent in my life. But not only in times past, but even right now, as I stand here in the presence of Almighty God, I am still not made whole. The same limitations I had when I approached you in this burning bush, I still have the same limitations. Nothing has changed. Listen to me. Listen to the way I stutter. Listen to the way I slur my words. It appears that not even an encounter with your power, God, not even an encounter with your power can deliver me from my infirmity. Paul the Apostle testifies and says three times, I asked the Lord to take away my limitations. But all he said to me is my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. But Moses is not asking God to take away his infirmity, no. Moses is asking God to exclude him from consideration based on his disability. Moses is asking God to give him a pass, to lower his expectations. I'm not the right one. I can't do it. No, I just told you, I just said that God allows his plans to be altered because of our limitations, and it's true. God always decides what is going to happen. This is why Paul so confidently declares in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that God works all things together for good for those who love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. God always decides what is going to happen. God always decides when a thing is going to happen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 teaches us that God works all things according to the counsel of his own will. God has predetermined when you would be born. God determined, has predetermined when you will die. Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. God knows when a thing is going to happen. Jesus says again, Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, no one knows about that day and hour, not even the angels of heaven, not even the Son, but only the Father alone. God decides when things are going to happen. God always decides who will carry out his plan. God calls each of his servants by name from Enoch to Abraham to Jacob and Joseph and Jesus. God always decides who will do his will. But the how of God's will is sometimes negotiable. This is an inspiring speculation, but it's more than just a speculation. This is a truth that even Jesus sought to take advantage of as he cried out from the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If this is, is at all negotiable, let this cup pass for me. Jesus was fully aware of the fact that in most cases, God has a myriad of methods, a myriad of avenues by which he can accomplish his will. Jesus understood that God has more than just one way to skin the cat. And if there are a thousand ways to skin the cat, God knows each and every alternative. Jesus Christ is asking God in the garden for an alternative. If there is any other way that your will can be done, Jesus was keenly aware of his own physical vulnerability, tortured by the very thought of his own mortality, emotionally drained by the prospect of having to suffer at the hands of wicked men. Jesus Christ was asking God 
for a plan B. But in Christ's case, there was no plan B. Only Jesus Christ could die and save the world. And the only means to bring about that salvation was through the cross. It was a non-negotiable. But in our text today, God gives Moses some wiggle room. God accommodates Moses' limitations, but not before he gives Moses a very mild reproof. Verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, who has made the human mouth? What are you talking about? You can't speak. Who, who made your mouth? Who makes anyone unable to speak or deaf? Who makes anyone able to see or to be blind? Is it not I, the Lord? If it is true, Moses, that you are slow of speech, it is because God has made you that way. God made your mouth. To make it more pointed, God has given Moses that impediment, that limitation. Let me ask you the question, what is your limitation? What is the thing that causes you to shrink away from doing God's will? What insecurities prevent you from stepping out on faith and doing great things for your God? What is your limitation? Is it a lack of education or a lack of skill? Is it fear of rejection? Is it insufficient resources? What is it? Whatever it is that causes you to withdraw from God's will, you need to understand that God was already aware of that lack and that limitation before he ever even called you. God already knows your limitation. It is God who has allowed your limitation to remain and God is able to accomplish his purpose despite your apparent inabilities. Moses, who is it that made your mouth? Oh, is me? Oh, well, now go, he says in verse 12. Now, then go. Stop procrastinating. Go. Stop making up excuses, Moses. Go. And I myself will be with your mouth and instruct you in what you are to say. I will be present then in the midst of your infirmity to make up the difference. And through your weakness, I will prove myself to be strong. Now go. End of conversation. No, not on Moses' part. Moses said, please, Lord. <laughs> I hear what you're saying. Please, Lord. Send your message by whomever you will. In other words, Moses is saying to God, send your message by anyone else besides me. I don't have the status. I don't have the courage. I don't think I will be able to speak to the people. I lack communication skills. So please, I am begging you, God, find somebody else. Whoa. Not only do I not want to do it, not only do I not have the ability to do it, I am not going to do it, so find somebody else. Okay. God has been very kind to Moses. God has demonstrated patience and empathy with Moses. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4 says that love suffers long and is kind. God is the embodiment of love and kindness to Moses. But what is the purpose of the kindness of God? Paul warns us in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 that we must not take the riches of God's kindness for granted. He says because the purpose of God's kindness is to lead us to repentance. God shows us his kindness to prove to us that he loves us, that he is there for us, that he is with us, so that we can have a change of heart and a change of mind. That is the purpose of God's kindness. God has been very kind to Moses. 
in order to give Moses an opportunity to change his mind, in order to encourage Moses to do his will without constraint, without the use of force. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, Peter advises the elders to shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily. Don't, don't make God have to force you to do his will. Because while at first God may be kind and accommodating to your weaknesses, if you remain stubborn and uncooperative at some point, God's patience is going to run short with you. Because God is not going to wait around forever. God has already predetermined the times and the seasons. And when your stubbornness begins to impede upon God's timeline, the God whose kindness you took for weakness ceases to encourage and begins to give command. No more still, small voice. No more whispering sweet promises in the wind. And that fire that was so gentle that it did not consume the bush, that same fire becomes a consuming fire, threatening to consume everything in its path, including you. Yeah. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. You've gone one or two steps too far. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. Our constant resistance to doing God's will at some point begins to grieve the Holy Spirit. God doesn't become so angry that he casts us off forever, but God has a multitude of ways by which he can register his disapproval, a myriad of means to discipline our hard hearts. And Moses is just about to learn how it feels to fall into the hands of an angry God. God's anger is now burning. <laughs> toward Moses. Look at what God says. He said, Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he's going to be overjoyed. So you are to speak to Aaron and put the words in his mouth. And I myself will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will instruct you in what you are to do. Aaron will speak for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as a God to him. You shall take in your hand this staff with which you shall perform many miracles. God is angry with Moses. That doesn't sound very angry to me. <laughs> doesn't sound angry at all, actually. It sounds like Moses got pretty much everything he wanted. He wanted some external reassurance, and God gave him the staff. He didn't want to go to Pharaoh alone, so God gave him Aaron and the elders. Now he doesn't want to have to speak to Pharaoh, so God gives him Aaron. This was how God expressed his anger with Moses, his stubbornness. Last week, I showed you how the staff would contribute to Moses' downfall. But just you wait and see how the elders of Israel and how Aaron, his brother, are going to become sources of continual consternation and frustration for Moses. Everything that God gave him, every extra thing that Moses required becomes a curse for him. Sometimes the most painful thing that God can do for us, brothers and sisters, is to give us exactly what we wanted. And with that very abstruse observation, let's pray. Father God, you have called us by your name. 
called us to salvation and you've called us into your service. But Father God, each one of us is keenly aware of our limitations and our shortcomings. And very often we are afraid to put our hand to the plow to do your will and your work in this world. Father God, give us strength and give us faith to believe today that your strength is made perfect when we are weak. Give us the ability, Lord God, to look beyond our own limitations and to see your power and to trust that your power works through us. Forgive us, Lord God, if we have grieved the Holy Spirit through disobedience and stubbornness. Forgive our refusal to do your will. Remove our obstinance, Lord God, and our stubbornness and make us more like Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. Help us, Lord God, to serve you willingly and voluntarily and not through compulsion. It is our greatest desire, Lord, to please you in everything that we do and in everything that we say. We humble ourselves before you now. As we reflect on the decisions that we didn't make, the things that we didn't do, even though we knew in our hearts that it was in your will, forgive us now. Give us the courage and the trust in you, Lord God, to go forward for your glory, to accomplish your purpose in the world. Thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness toward us. Thank you for your patience. Pray, Lord God, that your patience would lead us to repentance. Pray that we would have a change of mind and a change of heart and that we would become all in for you and for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.